Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the No Job Podcast. My name is Najee Simmons, your host here at the podcast. As always, we believe that everybody has to earn a living, but nobody has to have a job. You have to make money, and God made you to work. But you don't have to spend your existence uh, trading in your time and your energy for just enough money to live. You can find meaning in the work that you do. And it's been a while, but you know I like to have guests on the show who can talk to us about their experience pursuing just that, their God-given dreams and passions in the workplace and in the marketplace. Today, I have Linda Giramonti, a great friend, someone I go to church with, who is an awesome example of the kind of person that we all strive to be. She's a licensed therapist, and she operates Beyond Healing, a dope business that's all about helping people. But I'll let her tell her story through our conversation. Uh, Linda, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm glad to have you on. And I kind of like to start with this question a lot because it's really interesting to me because I want to know how people began to form their relationship with work. I want to know, can you tell me the first time that you remember earning money and what Ooh. were you doing for it? What was that situation? The first time? Um, I think oh. I was like 15, 16 years old. Uh -huh. um, and I was working in, uh, actually, I was working with my mom. She was a high school secretary and a private school, and I worked with her. Um, and I remember very distinctly getting my first $100 bill <laughs> um, and actually saving it because my sister was getting married and I actually wanted to give her, you know, um, a gift. So I remember saving it towards her, her uh, gift for her wedding. So that was my first memory of like really earning something that I was like, oh, this is mine. Yeah. I worked for this. Yeah, awesome. So obviously you felt, I guess, a sense of pride in earning money for yourself. Would that be correct? Yes. To say? Mm -hmm. So how did you feel about the work itself? I mean, was it back then when you were 15, 16, did you already know, I don't want to work in a nine to five type environment? Or was it just fine with you and you discovered that entrepreneurship was your path later on? I think I've always had that kind of feeling. Um, I come from a family that owns their own businesses and kind of were entrepreneurs. Um, I also was part of a group in my, I think, it, I think it was high school. I can't remember if it was middle school or high school, but it was an entrepreneur group um, that I actually ended up becoming the president of which was kind of like weird because I didn't even want to really be in this group I kind of got talked into it by my um, guidance counselor and I was like fine I add to my resume whatever um, oh so it must have been high school because I think it was for college and um, I ended up actually wanting to be a journalist at that time and I ended up working out of which is no longer there um, it was a newspaper ran out of Riverhead and now I can't remember the name of it I think it was Long Island Times or something like that um, and that was like my first like entrepreneurship type of work. Um, and I think I've always had it kind of in my blood, <clears throat> excuse me. And I knew that I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have a job that was meaningless. I knew that as, you know, I just didn't know exactly at that time as that, that young, exactly what that meant yet. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to kind of have something that was my own that I can call my own. Right. Question. Why did you relate entrepreneurship to uh, the experience you had in journalism? What were the parallels you saw there? So I did want to um, end up having my own magazine. I, I always had these goals like, OK, by the time I'm 30, I want to have this done. Um, I was into photography at the time, too. So I wanted to be like a photojournalist. I wanted to have my own magazine. I wanted to have my own um, gallery and so I always had this vision, like, okay, by the time I'm 30, I want to be my own, I want to be the editor of this and, and kind of like run around the world and take pictures for a living and just kind of like live life, you know, and enjoy what I was doing. Mm -hmm. A phrase I hear you saying a lot already is my own. You always knew mm -hmm. you wanted to have your own, even when you didn't know what your own thing was supposed to be. What mm -hmm. about having your own resonated with you, if you know, or was it, it, has it always been an innate feeling? I think it was an innate feeling, to be honest. Um, I grew up in a household, like I said, my dad owned his own business. Um, 
So I've watched that. I watched what it meant to build something with your own hands and how um, important that was. And because it was something that my family did, I think it was kind of something that, again, was just innate in, in me and that um, I knew it was something I wanted to do. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. Right. So how do you take a turn into the field you're in now? Can you describe your field for people at home and explain what it is you do? So I am a licensed mental health counselor in New York State. Um, so that means that I, I am a psychotherapist. I'm a counselor. Um, I work with individuals of all ages, couples, families. Um, and I just really work with any type of real um, issues. Majority right now is just in a anxiety and depression. Um, and I kind of help guide um, individuals through that and some life situations and, and stuff, especially now with COVID, um, there's just a lot more um, need in that area as well. Um, and that's kind of what I do. That's primarily what I do now as far as my private practice is concerned. Mm -hmm. And now, why are you doing that at a private practice? Because a lot of people do that uh, for agencies and for companies. Mm -hmm. So I know you've always had this idea to, to, to have your own. So was it ever even an option for you to just work for somebody doing the same thing? So I did start out in agencies. I worked for a very long time um, as an applied behavior specialist with adults with autism, um, which was with a nonprofit agency. And then I worked in a homeless shelter, which was also a nonprofit agency. Um, and it always felt like um, every time I was striving to get to like a different position or a higher position that was offered to me and I'd get it, um, I was never fulfilled. There was always something missing. I felt like, I, I felt like, okay, well, if I get to this, if I, put, if I would keep climbing the ladder, I'll be able to have more um, pull, so to speak. I'll be able to help more. I'll be able to be in a position where I can give back more. Um, and every time I kept climbing the ladder, it, it, it tended to be where you weren't getting that kind of um, ability. You had less power. You had less ability to really help people. It was more of very, um, you know, in some senses, it, it was just managed and in a way that you had to do it a certain way. And there was no breaking from that because of funding sources or just regulations and stuff like that, um, that were very strict. And I think, um, you know, during that time I was working in an, a private practice um, part-time with my old supervisor, who is actually how I got where I am now. Um, she helped me get my license because with my license in New York state, you have to get, um, 3,000 hours after you graduate with your master's before you can actually have your, your license to practice alone. And during that time, my old supervisor was looking to kind of branch out on her own. And she was like, hey, you helped me build my practice. Um, you'll get a couple of clients. You'll get to learn how to, you know, all the administrative stuff and I'll help you finish up your hours, um, which just means that she had to supervise me and sign off on them at the end, which I did. And because of that, the office that I'm in right now is the same office that she started in because we stayed close. And when she moved out of state, she actually gave me the opportunity to take over the lease of that office and make it my own. So that's how I really got to here was making those um, relationships early on that I didn't even know were forming into what is today. Right, absolutely. You never, I, I, I came up with a, a cute way of saying it, honestly, you never know when you're at rehearsal or when you're on the main stage. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You never know what you're doing right now, what that's going to count for, and who's observing it, what opportunities that'll grant you or bar you from. So not only did I get that out of what you just said, but the 3,000 hours is something amazing. Uh, for the folks at home, yeah. uh, my wife is actually a therapist working under Linda right now, and she's obtaining hours for her next step in her career. But it's funny because in a field like yours, everybody knows you, there's no having your own practice without 3,000 hours, right? Mm -hmm. but I feel like a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs in whatever field, maybe one that's not as regulated by the state as yours, think they're going to get it to happen without something like 3,000 hours plus everything else you have to put in mm -hmm. to make it happen. So just a word of caution to the people at home, 
just because the state doesn't make you get 3000 hours doesn't mean <laughs> you have a chance of making anything happen without at least that amount. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, I agree. Yeah. So when you took over the, the lease and uh, this space uh, from your old supervisor, from the person who kind of took you under her wing and, and taught you the ropes in the business, what, what were you feeling? Was it an automatic yes? Was it a maybe I'm not ready? Um, no, I was, I always had it in the back of my head because we, me and her always talked about how she was possibly moving out of state and she would offer me that, you know, that opportunity. So I always kind of knew like, oh, it's there somewhere very far, far down the road. Um, and when it happened, it was actually like, um, I just decided, I think maybe a few months before she approached me that she was definitely leaving, I decided to leave my position as a program manager um, and go into a group practice that I got offered a position at. And I was like, okay, this is a really good step to kind of get me to that place. Cause at that time I realized I was engaged to be married. Um, and I knew that that type of field that I was in, wasn't going to allow me the ability to have the life that I wanted as far as being a wife and, and a mother one day. Um, the demand was way too high. I was miserable all the time because of the stress. So it wasn't, it was just not conducive to my lifestyle and what I looked for, for my family in the future. Um, so me and my husband now decided at that point that, okay, if I'm going to do it, I got to do it now before we have kids, before we buy a house, before, you know, there's a lot more stress on us that we can't take those type of risks. Um, so I decided to leave a very good, um, protected position with a good salary and jumped head in to um, actually feet first, I think it was really um, into a group practice. And um, that tent didn't work out the way we expected to, to be honest. It was a, it was an experience, but it wasn't um, a profitable experience at first. So it was really a hard struggle. And we were kind of confused. I was kind of confused of what was happening at the time of why I felt the need to jump into it and it didn't work out as planned. Um, and then a few months later, um, my old supervisor, she approached me and said, hey, I'm actually moving in April, um, which is when we actually opened up that place, you know, 2015, April 1st. Um, so she was leaving April 1st of 2019. And I was like, okay, well, here's my opportunity, right? So this is what I wanted. This is what I prayed for. This is what I asked for. Um, this is what me and my husband spoke about, uh, doing. So now it's being presented. What do I do? And we were getting married in March of 2019. And I was supposed to take over this lease April 1st of 2019. So, and we learned this in November of 2018. So I did, had like a really short window of time to decide. Um, and my husband would always tell me like, you need to make a decision. If you want to be blessed with it, if you want it to be profitable, you have to just make a decision and then let God kind of do the rest. Um, so we talked it over and again, we decided, okay, this is the right time. If you're going to do it, do it. So I kind of just said, yes. Um, and from that point on, things just kind of fell into place. It was, um, it wasn't hundred percent smooth. I, I, you know, there's a lot of hard work to, to be done. I had to get, um, certain things done with the accountants and, and the state and, um, shifting things over with insurance policies and whatnot, and to build a, a caseload to sustain. Cause it was my full-time job. I didn't, I didn't work anything else. I jumped in completely with nothing else to, to kind of, um, protect us really. Um, and from day one till now, and I'm praying for the future, I have been good. Um, but again, it takes a lot of work and you have to be in that position to be willing to do that extra work and kind of look at how to in any business, not just a practice, but how to market it properly, how to like make relationships with people and really network yourself so that you're in a position that if you want to build later, you can. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how I got into this practice. And it was definitely a rocky road as far as mentally, because you really, you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. So there's a lot of faith you got to put into it. Um, especially when you don't have anything to fall back on in the moment, 
you, it's really scary. It could be really scary. <laughs> Definitely. So. Yeah. yeah, it seems like there's uh, two sides of the coin I'm hearing here. One side being the faith that you have to have in God, that you're not going to be able to supply every answer uh, to, mm -hmm. you won't even know all the questions that are going to arise in the future that yeah. will be answered. But at some point, you just have to have the faith and, and leap forward. On the other hand, there's your commitment. I once heard a, a quote from Kobe Bryant that came to mind. Uh, of course, he was speaking about basketball and about a, a situation he was in. And he said, um, it wasn't that I, I saw myself as ready to play at this level, but I made a commitment to become ready, no matter what that would be, no matter what that required of me. And that's what I'm sort of seeing in your situation. So you would never have said, I know everything I need to know to do this, but whether you said this explicitly or not, you demonstrated that you had a commitment to rise to the occasion to the best of your ability, even mm -hmm. when it was hard. Would you say, if you had passed up that opportunity, if you said, no, I'm not ready yet, do you think you would have at some other point gone forward and tried to do this? Or do you think that it was absolutely critical that you take that chance that you did? It was definitely critical for me to take that chance. That this oppor that opportunity would have never presented itself as a, again in the way that it did. Um, it was just too uh, easy, so to speak, to fall into. Um, the pieces were just lining up where it needed to be. And it, I just would have never gotten that opportunity again. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to people who are who may not have that opportunity in front of them, but they're progressing toward their goals, they know that they want to leave the stability of their uh, nine to five, their job to do what they want to do and be profitable doing it. But they're struggling because they know they're never going to have the answers. But at the same time, they want to be responsible and not crazy and not stupid. Mm -hmm. I've done stupid before and mm -hmm. I don't want anyone else to do it. So I, part, of, part of my job here is to help people understand when they're having faith and when they're being stupid. And nobody mm -hmm. can answer that question for someone else, but could you just share some of your thoughts on maybe some factors to consider when you're weighing those mm -hmm. things? Well, I think um, being able to know yourself really well and having that self-awareness is really key because when I, when I make a decision and I'm not the most decisive person, my husband will tell you that I'm not. <laughs> I will go back and forth on a decision a hundred times. Um, but I know that there's a certain um, feeling that I have to have in my heart over something and the, the peace that comes over me. And that's through prayer a lot of times, um, if not all the time. And, but that comes with self-awareness. You have to really know yourself of, are you, like you said, jumping into things and, and, and doing them kind of blindly? Because sometimes I, we want to do it, right? We want it, but it might not necessarily be something that we need at the time. It might not be something that's going to work out at that time. And, and I've made those mistakes too. I jumped into a group practice before I was ready to, and it didn't work out. And it kind of set me back a little bit financially. Um, but then other doors did open up that I was able to jump into. If I didn't make that decision, I don't know how things would have played out. Would I have been more ready? Would I have been more hesitant? I'm not sure. Um, but I think you have to weigh out your options. You have to decide, make goals, um, always reasonable goals too, um, and have a realistic expectation of what it is that you're looking to have and what, you're, what you want long-term. Um, and that's kind of what I've had to do and decided, you know, before I even got this opportunity, like, what does my life, what do, what do I want my life to look like? You know, nine to five job is great, but what does that mean? You know, what am I going to feel fulfilled at the end of the day? Am I going to feel like I'm doing something different in the world? Or am I just going to feel like another, you know, just, you know, clocking in, clocking out and just going through the motions. And I hate feeling that way. Um, so I knew that there had to be a change, but you always have to kind of, um, you know, weigh the options, have good support system. Um, I always bounce my ideas off of, you know, my husband, obviously, and I, you know, before my husband, and still now I still bounce them off my parents. Um, you got to vent them out out loud, I think. Um, our, our head has a lot of noise. 
uh, our mind tends to go back and forth and the fear starts, you know, really getting louder and that self-doubt gets louder. So you need to kind of bounce it off of somebody else um, that you trust and that has the best interest for you. Um, that's important to have good circle around you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I remember my, so I worked at a, a local government municipality for a long time, had the, the dreary, dreadful, uh, miserable feeling, clocking in, clocking out, nine to five. And I had an opportunity to go into sales and I didn't know myself. I didn't know I wasn't a salesman. <laughs> so in the beginning, I was actually doing fairly well, but that was because I know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the skills required to start really uh, making a living selling things to people that you don't know. I didn't mm -hmm. know how to network outside of my natural network of people that I knew. So once that dried up, I was in a, a terrible condition. So I know all about not knowing yourself and making the yeah. decision based on that and having a huge financial setback based on it. So once I got out of that, uh, thank God, and got back to stability, I'm still working a job now, but the idea is to not be doing so forever. I became inspired with the idea to have this show, and I'm so grateful to have you here because I think it, it adds so much credence to, to our message when we hear echo from people like you who are living that life. Mm -hmm. And something that you mentioned was you asked yourself, what kind of life do I want? and you reverse engineered what kind of work you would do uh, based on that framework. Right. Early in our conversation, you mentioned uh, you wanted a family, you wanted to have time with your husband. Uh, guys, Linda is a new mom. How old's the baby? She is gonna be three months on the 27th. Brand new mom, so shout out to you. So Thank now you. that it's, it's formulated, you've got the business, you're married, now you have your first child. Do you find that you're able to sort of manipulate your work to serve you much better than you would have if you were in some job? Oh yeah, 100%, 100%. Okay. What, what, um, I'm, what was that? What can you do now that you couldn't have done in um, a regular job situation? Um, set myself up for success <laughs> and have the flexibility. I, um, again, you know, right before, um, I was going out on maternity. Actually, I, I should say like last year, I decided that there's, when I got pregnant, that I had to make moves to be in a position to maybe pull back a little bit, not work as much as I was, because I was working like a lot um, because I'm, you know, what I have nothing else to do. So why not, you know? And, um, but then when I got pregnant, I was like, all right, pregnancy was a little rough in the beginning. So that kind of helped, you know, made me slow down a little bit. Um, but then I decided that I really needed to build my business for me to be in a better position um, to be able to have the lifestyle that I'm looking for. Um, and that's when I actually decided, well, I think it was like February, March, I actually decided that I was going to hire um, another clinician to work with me so that I can kind of offset my hours a little bit more. Um, and that's when uh, Jen came into um, working with me, which was 100% God sent. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, just even how it all came together. And it's been awesome. Um, but with that, that put me in a position to really kind of pull back even more than I was. I was working four days while I was pregnant. Um, I'm going back. I'm only going to be working maybe a couple, you know, maybe three days. And then the fourth day will be more of like business work. Um, which is important to know too, like running your own business um, is a 24 hour, seven day week job. <laughs> so there's, you know, I'm always getting calls. I'm always getting emails. I'm, you know, I'm constantly, you know, thinking about work. I'm constantly, you know, figuring out how to, you know, plan things, but um, being your own boss and having your own business, you are able to be more flexible. So with having, the baby and going back to work, I can make my own schedule, which is a lot easier. If I had a nine to five job, if I had a job as being a program manager, um, I'd be terrified to go back to work mm -hmm. um, because I would be working nine to five, sometimes having to go back in if there's emergencies, because that was a 24 seven operation. Um, so I wouldn't have had the, the ability to 
be a little less stressed knowing that I have coverage for the baby. I can be done at a decent hour. I can still have that family life. I can still have the independence of, you know, owning my own business and also being a clinician myself, which I love to do. Um, so yeah, I would have never had, um, what I'm walking into now, um, if I chose not to do the business. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing all this, Linda. You've been an inspiration to me and I'm sure to everybody who's listening. Can you please uh, tell them the name of your practice and any uh, anything else you'd just like people to know about you and how yeah. they can work with you? It's Therapy Beyond Healing. Um, it's also my name too, Linda Jaramonti, LMHC PC. Um, and we are located in West Savo. That's the main location. And I'm praying to um, have more locations in the near future. So keep posted on that one. Um, and we work with um, children to adults in any issues, um, anxiety, depression, um, school issues, anything like that. And um, families that are just struggling with um, you know, infertility or any new moms out there. Um, we love to, to work with them as well. And um, yeah, um, I think I answered your question. Yes, you did. And uh, just before you go, I'll, I'll let you get the last word. What do you wanna say to people who, who, who feel like they know themselves fairly well, they feel mm -hmm. like they are the right person to be doing what they wanna do, they're just scared, to take the first big step, to take the first big risk that's going to cause everything else to flow. What words would you share with a person like that? Uh, jump. <laughs> um, if you have already decided everything, you already figured out this was the best opportunity for you and, and the risk is good. Um, I mean, with any risk, it's going to be scary. So the fear is going to always be there. The self-doubt is going to always be there. Um, I still self-doubt all the time and, um, it's just the nature of it. So just do it. Um, you'll look back at that moment and you will be very happy that you did it and journal because I did in the beginning of all this. And I wrote down how I, what was happening, how I felt. And when I look back on that, it reminds me of why I'm doing what I'm doing. So just, just do it. If you have it and it's available to you and you could do it, do it. Thank you so much. Just do it and journal. Wise words from <laughs> Linda Giramonti. Thank you, Linda, so much. Um, hope to have you back someday. Hope you have an awesome night and appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Have a good night, Linda. Bye. You too. <laughs>